And one more announcement before we're led in prayer this morning by somebody you don't even know. Um, Frank Otiboteng is a new intern at Mount Vernon Presbyterian Church from Union Seminary down in Richmond. He's going to be with us for the next four months. He is, uh, was born and raised in Ghana, and I can't possibly say the city, although he has told me a couple times now. Um, he was educated there. He went on to pursue a college education in Germany where he studied, studied mining engineering. Um, and at some point in that time, he was born, he told me, and baptized in the Presbyterian Church, but kind of drifted away. Um, his faith kind of came to life again while he was in Germany. He came to the States, um, felt called to seminary. And so over the next couple of weeks, you will hopefully have, hopefully have the chance to get to know him a little bit. Um, he's going to get us a bio so that we can get that, Melinda, he's promised, in the Friday update this week, so you'll be able to get to know a little bit more about him, but please warmly welcome in, him into our, the Mount Vernon family, at least for the next couple of months. Would you pray for us, please? Beloved children of the Most High, let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, Lord of heavens and earth, we come into your presence in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, together with your whole church throughout the world. In the company of heaven, uh, we adore you, holy name. You are great, holy, wise, and loving. You are beyond all our understanding, and you have made us in all things for your glory. Therefore, today, together we say, Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was from the beginning, is now, and shall be, with world without end. Amen. Our today Bible, the first Bible reading, is taken from Psalm, the book of Psalm, chapter 146. I read. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. Sing hymns to my God while I exist. Put not your trust in the great, in mortal man who cannot save. He, his breath departs. He returns to the dust. On the day his plans come to nothing. Happy is he who has God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, maker of heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who secures justice for those who are wronged, give, gives food to the hungry, the Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord restores sight in the blind. The Lord makes those who are bent stand straight. The Lord loves righteousness. The Lord watches over the stranger. He gives courage to the orphan and widow, but makes the path of the wicked tortuous. The Lord shall reign forever, your God. O Zion, for all creation. Hallelujah. Amen.
Why don't you guys just come a little bit forward and have a seat right on the step there? Can you? Can everybody do that? Yeah. So, I'm concerned this morning because you guys just said words that I've never heard before. Were you talking? Come on down, you guys. Were you talking in a different language? Yeah. Do you think God understood? Like I heard you say. Did you say Ola? Ola. What, what does Ola mean? In what language? Spanish. Spanish. And I heard you say, ju- so, yeah, Salam. Is that in Farsi? And I heard you say, Buongiorno. That's hello. In what language? Do you know? Italian. That's Italian. Um, in Jambo? Is that Kenyan? Swahili. Swahili. That's right. Um, So do you think God understood what you were even saying? I thought he only spoke English. Do you think think God speaks other languages? We know so, right? We know that God speaks every language. God understands all of it, even sign language. And you know what? That's really good, Brielle, because not only... Does God read sign language? But sometimes God just reads our hearts. You know, like, we don't even need to tell God what's going on inside of us, what we're thinking, or what we're feeling. God knows it. And so if you're hurting, if you're sad, if you're really, really happy, God knows it already. And sometimes that's... That's helpful for us to remember because when we're really sad, have you ever been really sad? When, when I get really sad, like I don't even know what to pray for. The Bible tells us that in those times when we don't know what to pray for, we don't even need to pray. We don't need to say anything because God already knows it. He knows what's inside of our hearts. So remember that. Remember that God knows everything. And even when you don't know what to be praying for, or even if you you speak a different language, if you have friends that speak a different language, God understands it all and God knows it all. Okay, sorry, really quickly. Brielle, you brought something in in our children's sermon back today. What did you bring for us? A sleeping mask attached to a curtain hanger with great um, yeah you know what I'm going to say about this Brielle I'm going to say that even when you're sleeping even when you're sleeping God knows what's going on in your heart God is watching over you God is taking care of you and God is keeping you very close okay Let's pray, and then, let's pray first, and then I'll tell you where you guys are going to head, okay? Gracious God, we thank you for for knowing us and for loving us, for always listening to us and for being able to understand every single thing we say or think or feel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, even though we're having communion today, some of you are still going to go to... um, to children in worship, okay? We have one more week when we're going to use the bag. Just one more week. Who has, have you taken it at all, Evan? Have you, ha- has anybody, has anybody not taken it home? You're not going to be back next week? Have, are you going to be here next week, do you think? Do you want to take it home? Okay. If you're, if you're not going to be here, where are your mom and dad? Well, you, you're not, are you guys going to be here next week? Yes? Okay. You can take it and put something in it, and we'll we'll do our children's sermon on that next week, okay? All right. You guys can head back to your seats. Evan, we'll get you next time we do it again, bud. Okay?
Let's pray again. God, now by the power of your Spirit, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts and minds, God, may they be acceptable in your sight for the sake of the Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Our second reading this morning comes from the book of James. Listen for what the Spirit has to say to you. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. If any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to you. Let the believer who is lowly boast in being raised up and the rich in being brought low because the rich will disappear like a flower in the field. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word, and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves, and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers, who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion, it's worthless. Religion, that is pure and undefiled before God the Father, Care for the orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself unstained by the world. Friends, this is the word of the Lord and the poetry of the faithful. Thanks be to God. Well, it's one of my favorite books in the Christian scripture. And I've begun working on next year's preaching plan already, and we are going to spend a good five weeks, sometime next fall, I think, looking at the book of James. I certainly would never want to say anything to disrespect the great Martin Luther, to whom we Protestants owe a great deal, but I am glad he did not get his way and keep the book of James out of the New Testament, because that's really what he wanted to do. More than any other book of Scripture, James is interested in the way we live out our faith, putting behavior before and above belief. And as I begin to draw this sermon series to an end this morning, this series on what Jesus might have to say to the various religions of the world, I hope it is clear that I believe the message of James is very much akin to the message of Jesus. It's very much akin to what I believe Jesus would have to say to all of us. Jesus' desire first and foremost. Well, his message, it had little, if anything, to do with getting people to believe in church formulated doctrines about his identity or character or nature. Jesus said nothing about any of that. 
He came. And he made this clear again and again in his ministry to show us the way to God, to model for us a life lived in communion with God by living in community with those around us. Like the book of James, for Jesus, faith was about loving God and loving neighbor. And as David Lamont pointed out so well last week, he said it several times in his talks to us. The two are not separate commands, loving God and loving neighbor, but rather two ways of saying the very same thing. I think it's one of the reasons people like Chuck Higdon have such a powerful impact on us. Not because of what Chuck believed. In fact, I bet most of you, we pastors, we get the privilege of, of having very intimate conversations. I know a little bit about what Chuck believed. I'm wondering how many of us really know anything, outside of his family maybe, about what he really believed. We know how he lived. That's what touches us, isn't it? That's what changes us, and that happens regardless of what Chuck believed. The timelessness of this series um, humbles me, and not just because of Chuck's example or Matt's dad's example, even though I didn't know him. That's not what makes this series so fascinating and how God orchestrated it to be preached at this particular time. But look at what is going on in our world. Look at all that has happened in our world since this series began back in January. Think about the evil being perpetrated by terrorists just this past week. I know their beliefs are not an accurate reflection of Islam. So I don't call their beliefs into question. And frankly, their beliefs are irrelevant to me. What is so problematic when we look at the terrorists around the world today is their behavior. That is what we call into question. In the 21st century, we simply do not burn people to death. We don't behead journalists because we don't like what they say. That kind of behavior needs to be named for what it is, evil. And it needs to be challenged not just by Christian pastors, but by any religious person anywhere, by anyone who claims to know and serve God. None of us, none of us, regardless of the religious label we wear, can claim to be loving God, however we name him or her, if we are not loving one another. Because in the end, in the end, what does Paul say will remain? You know that verse? Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Pretty basic. I didn't realize it until I was working on this sermon this week. How fascinating that he doesn't say faith is the most important, isn't it? It's, it's critical for us. It's right up there with hope and love. But in the end... What does Paul say will remain? Not faith, but love. My point this morning is that in spite of our many doctrinal differences, in the end, that is what it's all about. And when we've whittled down the major religions of the world and their primary beliefs, eventually we wind up with this common call to love. God and one another. And while some may, in fact, do a better job, it seems, of encouraging that than others, the, care, the call to care is found in all of the religions of the world, from Judaism to Islam, from Buddhism to, as we're going to discover this morning, Hinduism. That's where we are today. So, my question, what do you know about Hinduism? Hinduism. It's a tough one. I know that. 
Those of you who were in Sunday school a couple of weeks ago, you should know all about it, right? Anything, do you know anything about Hinduism? Smallest thing. Kimberly? Polytheistic, okay. Anything else? Okay, well, we'll start at ground zero here, briefly. And, and let me say this. Um, if you were in the Sunday school class from a couple weeks ago, you know how complicated a faith it is. Um, and so, in my attempt this morning, I'm using, a br I'm using broad brush strokes. And I say that because Hinduism does not have one set of core beliefs. When you think of Christianity being a religion full of all kinds of denominations, Hinduism has many, many more. And so it's very difficult to say this is exactly what a Hindu person might believe. I will start by saying this. this. Um, it is a polytheistic religion. There are many gods. They do believe, all of the different sects do believe, that there is one god who's kind of over and above all the rest. But it is primarily a polytheistic religion with many gods. It is the primary religion of the people of, in India and Nepal. And it is the oldest major religion in the world. The oldest religion. I said a couple weeks ago that Judaism was the oldest monotheistic religion. Hinduism is the oldest religion in the world. It has close to one billion adherents. And in my studies, um, I think it is the hardest to explain and understand because it is so diverse. Like classic Buddhism, Hinduism embraces this concept of reincarnation. And they see all living things as being part of this endless cycle of creation and death and recreation. And so the first thing for us to remember about Hinduism and to know is that every living thing is considered sacred. Every living thing is part of this great cycle. Hindus believe in the concept of what they call the truth, the eternal truth, capital T, it lies within each one of us. And while I have not found much anywhere about our responsibility to care for creation or to seek justice, kind of caring for one another, we are called to respect all living things because of this truth, this divine spark, if you will, that exists in all people. They, like Buddhists, believe in the law of karma, so we kind of create our own destiny. Good karma leads to a good life. Bad karma leads to a bad life. There are good consequences for our action, and there are not so good consequences for our actions. They're guided in the way they live by what they call Vedas, and there are over a thousand different Vedas. These are old Sanskrit texts written thousands of years ago in ancient India. And they are explained and re-explained. And that, those, those Vedas are kind of used to, to create rituals and worship practice that they choose which they want to embrace and apply to their own lives. And they're all different for all different people. Their, their faith is often symbolized by the lotus blossom. Because like a lotus flower with four petals... It has four major denominations, four major sects within Hinduism. Three of them are named according to the god that they have chosen as their supreme god. Interestingly, the fourth one, they don't name god, they just leave it up to the adherents to name. You can name and call god whatever you want to call god. They refer to these gods, get this, as avatars, Young people, sound familiar? Yes. You saw the movie Avatar? The Avatar is what they believe to be a bodily expression of divinity. And so they refer to, that's kind of their avatar, these gods. It's left up to you to determine how you want to worship 
and how you want to serve all of these various guards. And, and what they're designed to do is help you to move closer and closer to the eternal truth that is within you. That's what all of these Vedas and, and avatars are designed to do, move you closer and closer to what is at the heart of who you are. And every person is going to have a slightly different take on what that process looks like. You may have heard of the Bhagavad Gita before. That's not in any way sacred, like we would see the Bible, but it is an important Hindu book that explains different ways you might follow this path to get to God. They, like Buddhism, engage in the practice of yoga as a way of meditating and being brought into touch with that spark that is within you. And perhaps the most significant thing that we all know about Hinduism is that uh, it's based in a, in a class system. As you move through life, various lives, as you are reincarnated again and again, you are in a different class based on the way you previous lived, previously lived. And so the better you live, the higher your class. Ultimately, you just want to eliminate sin. Be more in touch with that God spirit that is in you. The final belief that I hope you will not forget is one that I think is the most important, and it's where I want to spend most of my time this morning. Some have said that Hinduism can be boiled down to three different beliefs. This whole idea of reincarnation, caste, following this path toward um, being in touch with the light within you. The third basic and most critical point is this. According to Hinduism, no religion, no religion, not even Hinduism, offers the only way to salvation. No religion, hear that, no religion offers the only way to salvation. In Hinduism, it is explicitly taught, and there are not many things that are explicitly taught, we know that, that no one religion can be elevated among all the others. They are all man-made, human-made attempts to reach holiness, to reach divinity. And there are different ways we come to know and to see and experience this light of the one we call God. That is so critical for us. Most of you know, I think by now, that I'm a fan of Amy Grant. I've been a fan since I first heard her music in 1981. I've been to at least a dozen of her concerts. I met her. Ha, you didn't know that. I met her in 1983, actually shook her hand, got her autograph. Her songs speak truth to my life. They give a voice to things that I feel, to things that I wrestle with. And I have always introduced anyone I love to Amy Grant. Shan has been dragged to a couple of her concerts. She's been forced to listen to her since we got married. My kids know that on Christmas morning, they do not come downstairs to open their presents until they hear Amy Grant singing on whatever stereo radio was playing. They know that. When I did youth ministry, I dragged kids to, to a concert anytime Amy Grant was in 200 miles, within a distance of 200 miles from our church. And every church I've ever preached at, as you know, I've talked to about Amy Grant. Here's the thing. I would never want you or anyone else to think that Amy Grant is the only musician who can speak to your heart. Shan thinks it's the Beatles. <laughs> you know, you might think it's somebody else. Further, while I have every album that Amy Grant has ever recorded, I do have other ones too. 
I have James Taylor, I have Diana Krall, I have countless other CDs, all kinds of other music I love listening to. Why? Because there is more than one way to be moved. There's more than one way to be motivated. There's more than one way to be brought into the presence of God. Now, if that's too trite an example for you, let's talk about call. My call is to ministry in the church. As a teaching elder, a pastor, that's my call. I've given my life to this institution that we call the church. And while there are lots of days, not a lot. Well, I have those days like everyone where I wonder if that was the best call. I love what I do. I love the church. And as a result, that has kind of shaped what my work life has been about for the last 29 years. But is it the only way for a faithful follower of Jesus to live out their call? If you were in Faith in Action today, you know that is not the case at all. What would we do if everyone were a pastor and nobody were a dentist like Jay Guerin? Think of the call on your life. What would we do if all followers of Jesus were clergy and we didn't have Christian teachers, Christian nurses, Christian businessmen and women? What would we do? What would the world be like? I see God at the beach. You may see God at the mountains. Racism. Homophobia, they break my heart. But for you, for you the issue might be abortion, gender issues, homelessness, poverty. Some of you are drawn to learning about the Arab-Israeli conflict, while others are committed to the problems facing the nations of Africa or South America. Some of you are drawn to environmental issues, and still others are committed to issues involving the arts or education. Marcus Borg is the man who speaks to me with great power and wisdom. But for you, well, for you it might be C.S. Lewis or Mary Oliver if you listened to Trista, Krista Tippett this morning. Dead Poet Society makes me cry every time I see it. And when I see Robin Williams in Patch Adams, I cannot help but think of the church and new ways of being. But for you, well, your heart might be captured by a totally different movie with a totally different plot. Before I lose you all, why have we come to believe that in matters of faith, there is only one way to express ourselves? Why have we done that? Why do we think that when it comes to God, the most complex, the most out there concept that there is, why have we come to believe that there is only one book that accurately talks about him, one people that rightly describe him, one word that appropriately names him, one pronoun that can be used for her. We give one another so much latitude when it comes to so many other things in our lives, yet when it comes to religion, when it comes to religion, we have adopted a mindset that we reject in most other aspects of our life by mistakenly buying into the idea that in order for my faith to be right, Everyone else has to be wrong. Is it not possible for me to agree with a Hindu that no religion provides the one soul path to God while at the same time remaining passionate about my love for Jesus and my desire to share him with everyone I meet? 
Is it not possible to hold those two things very gently, very delicately in tension with one another? Of course it is. It is possible for me to be open to other people's faith while at the same time remaining committed to Jesus' call upon my life and to to be faithful to that call which, which mandates that I make disciples of all nations. And I'm not betraying my faith or watering down the gospel or, or betraying Jesus by embracing a theology of inclusiveness and don't even think political correctness when you hear that word. Religious Theological inclusiveness is, has nothing to do with political correctness. It's about gospel correctness. It's about Jesus' correctness because that's the way Jesus lived his life. So what would Jesus have to say here? To recap, to the Jews, I think he'd say thanks for the stories and the traditions that remind us how faithful God is, but don't forget the grace. Grace always comes before law. To the Muslim, I think he'd say thanks for the passion, but please don't forget the love, because in the end, that's what faith is all about, loving one another. I think he'd thank the Buddhists for lifting up the way of the Buddha, a way that is very much like his own way. And to the Hindi, I think he'd say thanks for the humility. Thanks for recognizing that the way of faith in God is so much bigger than any of these religions that we have built for ourselves. But to both the Buddhists, And to the Hindu, I think he challenged them to remember that in the midst of seeking nirvana, in the midst of seeking the light themselves, they also need to care for others. They also need to love others. Next week, I'm pulling it all together with what I think Jesus might have to say to one more faith of the world. Our faith. What might Jesus, if he were here today, have to say to Christianity? And I'm letting you know this ahead of time because I'm going to ask you during our sharing time what you think. One or two sentences. Don't preach. That's my job, okay? One or two sentences. Think about that this week. Of what you think Jesus might have to say to Christianity in 2015, all right? But now... As we continue to reflect on the faiths of the world and their common call to love, I invite you to prepare your hearts to come to this table. Because loving one another is what this table is all about. Prepare yourself. Prepare yourself to remember again the most beautiful example of love we have in human history. A love that is willing to give everything. A love that is willing to put everything on the line. That is the message of most of the world's great religions and it is the heart of Christianity. As the choir sings for us, Allow the words of James, the call to be doers of the word, to love God by loving others. Allow that to soak into your bones, to wash over you, and to prepare you for all that lies ahead this week. This time, would our ushers please come forward to receive the offering?
this is the joyful feast of the people of God. This is the praise that we offer to God this morning. We do this. We gather at the Lord's table month after month in remembrance of Him because here something, something mysterious happens. The symbolism of the Lord's Supper is so rich. And there are all kinds of things we take away from it, but I'm not sure are any I'm not sure any of them are more important than this idea of a self-giving love. This is the table that reminds us of the depth of God's love for us, revealed in the person we know as Jesus. Scripture says that someday, down the road in a coming kingdom, people will come from east and from the west from the north and from the south. I have to believe from from Buddhist traditions and from Hindu traditions and from Jewish traditions, from all of these great traditions of the world, all seeking after God, somehow, some way, we one day will sit at one table in the presence of holiness and we will experience what this communion is with God is ultimately all about. As you come to the table this morning, may you catch just a glimmer of that. May you catch a glimpse of what that is like. Scripture over and over again tells us stories of people's attempt to reach God. But what makes Christianity so unique and beautiful for me is that it's one of the few religions about God actually coming to us in Jesus, showing us how we might better know Him and love Him. And as we gather at table, remembering His life and His death and His resurrection, we are reminded of. So come, wherever you are in your faith, whether you're a doubter or a seeker, whether you're a disciple or a saint, come. The invitation is to all of us. Let us pray. Holy God, Feed us this morning with spiritual food. Take these very common elements of bread and juice and transform them so that they might become for us powerful symbols of Jesus, of a love given away, so that as we partake of these elements, we might be better equipped to so live our lives. God, we know that we come to this table as broken people, as cracked vessels that that are not able to fully hold or bear your light completely. But God, it is through those cracks that your light shines around us. So forgive us for our feeble attempts to be doers. Forgive us for the times that we fall short, for the things that we do that don't reflect a faith in you, for words that are spoken in anger far too harshly that do not display any of the grace and mercy that we know are part of the life that you want to give us. Forgive us. God, forgive us for those things that we now, in silence, bring before you. God, your word says that when we do that, when we bring before you our sins, 
you forgive us, and you give us a fresh start. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Equip us now. Feed us now so that we might follow Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. When Jesus sat with his disciples in that upper room, he took bread, and he broke it. And he gave it to his friends, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And that too, he gave to his friends, saying, This cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of all your sins. Whenever you drink, remember me. Would our servers please come forward? We receive communion by intinction here at Mount Vernon. You will be invited to come forward. You can take a piece of gluten-free bread, dip it into the cup, and then return to your seats by the side aisle. Friends, come, taste, see. The Lord is good.
as we prepare to leave, what would you like to lift up to our God in prayer this morning? We will certainly keep the Wheeler families and the Higdon families in our prayers. What other, what other things? Um, it's up in my notes. Faye, uh, one of the women who helps Mel in the kitchen on Wednesday Night Lives, for, was it her father that passed away? Oh. So it's Mel's father-in-law who passed away. We okay, so we need to remember Mel and his family. What else would you like to lift up? Carol? Okay. Okay. For family who's just dealt with some small strokes this week, we will remember them. Kay? Okay. For Roberta, um, not quite the flu, but something close, we will remember her this week. Julie? Okay. For the Olson family, a friend of Julie's at work, Debbie, who passed away, we will remember them. In the midst of pain, there's also joy. So uh, what are you celebrating today? Ken? Prayer of Thanksgiving uh, for my father. He had surgery this week to remove a section of his colon because of cancer. Seems to be doing okay, so thankful for that. Great. For successful surgery for Ken's uh, dad, we will give thanks with you. What else? Yes, Joy? That's right. Caitlin's birthday is today, 22 years old. If you're friends with her on Facebook, make sure you say happy birthday. Great. Yes, Emily? Just wanted to say it's uh, Boy Scout Sunday today. We're going to give thanks for all of our Boy Scouts. I saw Jason, Jason in his and uniform, and who else? I saw one other one. Evan. What? Evan, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's say if you see the Boy Scouts over there for coffee, give them a hug, and we'll give thanks for them this morning. Okay? We'll give thanks for the healing that has come to Kay's sister and give thanks for friends and family that stepped in and helped her out. How about a 59 degree day? We'll give thanks for that today as well. Gracious God, we are, we are grateful for all the blessings of life. Dare we say we are grateful for the struggles and the challenges. It reminds us of our humanity. It reinforces our need for one another. God, it grows our dependence on you. So take our joys, take our pain and our struggles, and God, as only you can do, bring good from them all. Your word says, all things work together for good for those who love you and are called by you. And we are those people. So use all that is going on right now to take us deeper in our walks with you. Grow our understanding of your love. Enrich the way we seek to follow Jesus. And tune us to that spirit that is singing within us all. Send us forth now to be your people with a burning passion to love others and to love you. For Christ's sake, amen. Please stand for our closing hymn of praise.
are to him who by his Spirit's work in each one of us is able to do abundantly more than anything we hope, dream, or even dare to imagine. To him be all glory and honor in our lives and in this church, now and for all eternity. And all God's people agreed and said, Amen. Amen.